butterfly disguised as it was if i dare get too close would you sting me i don't think okay thanks uh, just thank me for the so many people there to knock a festival. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, the, the talk, I suppose, as Mick said, relates to um, primarily this family here, uh, the Galisteggis, um, and events surrounding the Spanish Civil War uh, in the 1930s. Um, so their experience is, is, kind of, is what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, First thing to say, I suppose, the story, I'm going to begin the story, if you like, in the 1960s. Um, and then we're going to go and, and trace what happened. Because there's an interesting piece which kind of explains the, uh, the origins of the time for the talk, which is Irish citizens of Basque origin, uh, the story of Irish Basque refugees during the Spanish Civil War. So the start of it is in 1962. Um, and one of the, the children, which is uh, Iker, on the wood here with kind of check top the tall man. Um, in 1962 there was a one of the kind of public the TDs, uh, Joseph Barron, raised a question in the doll uh, and asked uh, the teacher at the time, Sean Lavas, um, asked him to put a question to him um, concerning Iker's plight. Um, so the, the question concerned the plight of an Irish citizen against whom the French government uh, had issued an expulsion order in 1962. And Baron wanted to know what actions the tea shop intended to take um, and whether this Irish citizen of Basque origin was to be made a plaything between de Gaulle and Franco. The mass replied that representation about the case was immediately made to the French authorities by the Irish Embassy in Paris and that the Embassy had been informed that, quote, Mr. Galastegui would not be permitted to continue to reside on the Spanish frontier, but uh, that in deference to its representations, his place of residence was being changed again to a district likely to be more acceptable to him. So, who was this very citizen of Basque origin? Um, so, in, in some sense, we have to go back quite a bit um, to kind of tell the story. Um, so, what I'm going to do first, I suppose, really, is, is to kind of tell some of the background and, and to put all of this in context, which is related to um, uh, Basque nationalism. Um, so, I'm going to just show a map. Uh, okay, so just briefly. Okay, this is the Basque country. Um, it is located, uh, it straddles, I suppose, the, the, the French and Spanish borders. So, to the south, you have four provinces. Uh, now, the name itself in Basque is Euskalaria. Um, and that, that derives from the Basque language of Skera. And literally translated, Euskalaria literally translated as the land or the people of the Basque country. Um, so, the, the Bay of Biscay and the Cantabrian Sea is kind of to the, co the coast and then the Western Pyrenees, it straddles the Western Pyrenees. So you have four provinces in the Spanish state, which is Araba, Biscay, Gipuzkoa and Navarra, um, and three in the French state, which is reportedly uh, Bahid Naforo, which is Lower Navarra and Zubara. Um So you have seven provinces. Um, uh, divided between two uh, two states, uh, Spain and France. Um, it covers a landmass of about 20,000 kilometers square, which is probably the equivalent size of the province of Lens. Um, and has a population uh, of about 3 million, uh, a million of which live uh, in Bilbao, which is the, the largest city, which is in, uh, in the sky uh, to the east. Um, now, I won't go in, but essentially the three provinces to the east, Capusco, Araba, and Biscay, form what's called the Basque Autonomous Community, um, and Navarre is a separate autonomous community within, within the Spanish state. Um, and the capital uh, of the Basque country is Pamplona, or uh, Irunia as it's called in, in Basque, which is in the province of Navarre. It's probably geographically, and, and, and just to give some sense of, of, of where it is. Um, so politically, um, I suppose the seeds of Basque nationalism were laid in the late 19th century um, in the aftermath of the Carlos Wars. Now, I'm not going to go into the history of the Carlos Wars, but the Carlos Wars ended in, in 1876. Um, and what was significant about them up for, for uh, hundreds of years, from about the 11th or 12th century, um, the Basque country was governed by what were called charters or fueros, which were kind of uh, traditional uh, customs. Um, land was held, was held in common 
um, and there was a considerable degree of autonomy from, from uh, the Spanish monarch, uh, exempting uh, Basque provinces from royal taxes and compulsory military service. Um, so the abolition of the pharaohs at the end of the Carlist Wars, alongside the development of the iron mines, which are going to come to in, in Bilbao, uh, and the development of the shipyards in Bilbao, led to a rapid industrialization uh, of uh, that part of the Basque country. So this is, is the shipyards uh, in Bilbao around the turn of, of the last century. Um, so the, the population of Bilbao grew uh, substantially uh, over that time. Uh, there was huge industrialization. Was, uh, the mountains surrounding uh, Mobile contained a lot of iron ore, uh, which was, hadn't been mined up to then. Uh, so there was massive investment, particularly from uh, British finance companies and banks, uh, into the mines of Mobile. Um, so you had the development of, of the, ship, the, the shipbuilding industry uh, and the steel industry. Um, so what happened at that time then, you had a massive influx of workers um, from other parts of the Spanish state. Uh, who were Spanish speaking um, and you also had the development, the early development of uh, the Basque Labour movement uh, and uh, socialist movements um, and a series of quite bitter struggles around uh, paying conditions. It was uh, quite not dissimilar to uh, what would have happened I suppose in Britain at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, here, not so, but certainly if you think something like the, the 1930 lockout, that type of, of conflict uh, along the along the docks there in, in Bilbao. Just to mention actually, um, because one of the key figures, I'm not going to go into her life, but, but one of the key figures uh, in the Spanish Civil War was Dolores Ibaru, uh, La Passionara, uh, she's probably known to a lot of you. Uh, Dolores Ibaru was actually from uh, Bilbao, she was born in a town in Galarta, um, she was a mine in town, her father was a miner, um, and I suppose she's most maybe popularly known for her her slogan during the, the Battle of Madrid, or the Siege of Madrid of uh, No Passeran. Um, and she also delivered the farewell uh, speech to the International Brigades in 1938. Um, she was Basque, her, but she joined the Communist Party uh, and was a key member of the Communist Party, Spanish Communist Party, uh, for many decades. Um, so, just to mention that as, a, as, a, as an aside. Um, the, the next figure, if you like, a key figure in, in Basque nationalism, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but uh, is this uh, this gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Sabino Arana? Um, so all of that development in, in in the shipyards, the development of the, the workers' movement, led to a reaction uh, from uh, people like Sabino Arana, who was a key figure at that time. Um, he was quite a conservative uh, nationalist uh, and is considered to be uh, the founding father of Basque nationalism. Um, he was a devout Catholic. Um, and was quite distressed uh, at the influx of uh, Spanish-speaking workers uh, and what he considered to be the, the secularism, or what was the secularism of the workers' movement. Um, and he believed that that, that threatened uh, the traditional way of life of Basques. Um, so in 1895 he founded the Basque Nationalist Party. Um, and their motto, which will kind of give you an indicator of the type of party he was, their motto was God and the old laws. So, kind of reflect on the kind of conservative nature of that party at that time. Um, now in its early formation, uh, the PNV, as it was called, the Nationalist Party in Spanish, uh, Partido Nacionalista Vasco, the PNV, um, they sought complete independence from both Spain and France uh, and, and looked for an independent Basque country. Um, but in the early 1900s, its position shifted. Um, he died, Sabino Rana died in 1903, and the party was taken over by a uh, man called Ramon de la Sola, who was a huge uh, industrialist, very wealthy, probably one of the richest men in Europe. Um, and he had invested a lot in the mines in, in the Bell. Um, de la Sola was not so much in favour of independence, he favoured autonomy within the Spanish state. Um, now, this caused a split um, within the organisation, and who emerges from that is. A uh, key figure in our story is, is Elias Galastegui, who's, who's the father of Ypres. Um, and Elias was quite young at that time, um, but he became quite a significant figure in Basque nationalism and was to spend around four decades of his later life in exile, including quite a substantial period of time in Ireland. Um, so that's Elias Galastegui. Um, he was a member of the Basque youth movement, was say, frustrated with the, with the turn that the uh, 
uh, the PNV had taken. But he was also um, quite influenced by the nationalist movement in Ireland. Um, so at that time, uh, you had the development of a revolutionary movement in Ireland from 1914, um, and he was quite influenced by the 1916 Rising. Um, now, the, the PNV at that time had taken quite a pro-British stance. Um, there was a lot, as I said earlier, there was a lot of British investment in the shipyards in Bilbao, and the Lesota uh, provided a lot of shipping to uh, the British Navy. Um, for his services to the British Crown, he was he was uh, given a order order of the British Emperor. Um, so their position on the 1916 Rising and the War of Independence in Ireland was not that surprising, given the the uh, uh, the relationship that that uh, they sort of had with the British state. Uh, but it was something that that Iker uh, was was very uh, opposed to. Um, I say he was a great admirer of the nationalist and republican movement in Ireland. And in one of the many pieces he wrote for the Bass Nationalist, uh, one of the publications under the pen and Gadari, he described the 1916 Rising as a great example of heroism and dignity. Now, in 1922, uh, Elias invited uh, Michael by the name of Ambrose Martin uh, to address a meeting in Bilbao about the role of women in the Irish Nationalist movement. Now, there's an interesting story about Ambrose Martin that I don't have time to go into, but um, he had been expelled uh, by the British. Uh, in 1919, uh, he was expelled from Ireland. Uh, he had been uh, born in Argentina. His father was an Argentinian sailor. His mother was from the Midlands. So he was expelled from Ireland for his Sinn Féin activities in 1919. Um, and he did return for a short period of time uh, during the troops and left again. Uh, and lived for some time in Bilbao. Um, so he met up with, with Elias and addressed the meeting about coming him on in Bilbao which was to become um, the influence, if you like, or uh, Elias uh, was so taken with this that, that he proposed the establishment of um, Emma Kume Amritsali Batse, which is the, uh, this organization, which was the, the Bassa National Women's League, uh, which was founded a couple of months after that talk. And that's them marching at the head of a, um, a demonstration in 1932, which is uh, a very Aguna, uh, which is the Basque uh, National Day, uh, which was again was organised by by Elias uh, on Easter Sunday, and um, to show his respect, if you like, for the 1916 Rising, uh, and it was led by uh, the women. Um, and his that that uh, day is still uh, it's, it, every every Easter Sunday uh, there is a demonstration in support of Basque independence, uh, organised by the pro independence left in the Basque country. Um, so, uh, Iker was, or sorry, Elias was also quite taken with um, uh, the sporting movement and, and, and how uh, sport was used in Ireland as a mobilising force. Uh, and in 1923, he established the uh, Mendio Boma Challenge, my Basque is not very good, but uh, it was Federation of Mountaineers in 1923. Which again remain, remains a feature of, of the pro independence movement. Um, obviously, the, the Pyrenees uh, straddles the Basque country, so it's, it's quite a popular uh, pastime, but, but it, it, it's still an important aspect of, of the movement there. Um, and he also set up political street theater groups, and that's where he met his wife, Margarita. Um, she was also part of the uh, youth movement and was an actress, and they married in 1925. Um, now, that's, this was their first period of exile because two years previous, um, their Spanish dictator Primo de Rivera uh, had uh, taken power or seized power, uh, which there followed a wave of, of uh, repression and arrests. And Anais and Margarita were forced to flee across the border uh, to the northern Basque country in the French state uh, and then on to Mexico. Uh, so Iker was only six months at this stage, uh, six, he was just born. Um, so he spent the first five, year, five years of his life in Mexico. Uh, his father uh, worked on a ranch which uh, belonged to a friend of his. Um, and they stayed there for five years. The dictatorship fell in 1930 and the family returned in 1931. And two of Iker's brothers were born in Mexico, uh, Lander and, and Illinois. Um, on their return, they had, uh, the couple had two more children. Uh, two girls, uh, sisters are Jeanne and Limbe. Um, and 
and always took up a, a role in, or a job in the Basque, or sorry, the Bilbao Steelworks as an administrator. And as I say, in 1932, he had organised this demonstration, uh, which was the first uh, uh, Barry Aguna, which is, a, as I said, the Basque uh, uh, National Day. Um, so, they're back in the Basque country, and they're not there too long when uh, the Civil War uh, in July 1936. Um, now, people obviously will be familiar with this image, uh, which is Picasso's painting of uh, uh, the bombing of Guernica. Um, now, I'm not going to go into a history of the Spanish Civil War, uh, but suffice to say there were divisions within uh, our society, uh, across the, the, the Spanish state. Um, but the Basque Nationalist Party, which at that point in the 1930s was led by Antonio Aguirre, uh, supported the Popular Front government, uh, which had been um, elected uh, a couple of months previous to the, to the attempted coup. Now, they supported the Popular Front on the basis that the Popular Front had offered autonomy to the Basque country, uh, or certainly to three of the provinces, which we mentioned earlier, which was uh, Vizcaya, Gapuscoa, and Araba. Uh, which are the provinces uh, to the uh, to the west? Um, so, on the first of October, um, Antonio Guerrero was, was sworn in as the first president of uh, autonomous Bas the autonomous Basque community, uh, and it was, he was sworn in under the uh, oak tree in, in Guernica, which is, is a kind of historic uh, place, or sacred place, if you like, for Basques in the sense that it was the place going back hundreds of years. Um, where the, the King of Castile would, would promise to uphold uh, what we talked about earlier, which were the charters of Fueros. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a, an iconic place for Basques. So he was sworn in there, uh, but within uh, within a couple of months, um, the Basque country had fallen. Uh, so um, Navarre and uh, Arana, those two provinces, uh, fell quite quickly. Uh, Within, within weeks of, of the coup. Um, Capusco fell kind of late 1936, so there was, there was quite a lot, of, uh, much stronger resistance in the sky. The, the Basque National Party had set up uh, the Basque Army um, and they put up a lot of resistance. Um, but the, the fascists had concentrated their forces at that time on the siege of Madrid. Uh, they failed to break the siege, the siege of Madrid, so they turned their attention to the north. Um, uh, Guernica was bombed on uh, the 26th of April in 1937. Um, now the, the, the town was completely destroyed. Um, that's the aftermath. It's quite a small town, with a population of a couple of thousand. Uh, the German Condor Legion essentially carpet bombed it. Um, and there was hundreds, some put the figure at the slightly around a thousand, but certainly hundreds killed. Uh, and the town was flattened. Now the, the, the tree of Guernica survived and the arms factory, was, there was an arms factory in the town that survived, which was obviously of interest uh, to the fascists. Um, so within weeks of, of the bombing of Guernica, um, Bilbao fell. Um, and that, that image is from uh, Robert Kappa, uh, which is again uh, quite, a, quite a striking image um, of an air raid in, in Bilbao. Um, now, after the bombing of Guernica, um, there was a mass evacuation uh, of Basques. Um, and that brings us to uh, the arrival, if you like, of or how the, the Galisteges ended up in Ireland. Um, so, there was tens of thousands of Basques. So I think uh, the, the figures put it something in the region of 150,000 Basques that were evacuated uh, during the Civil War. Um, most, I think there was about 4,000 went to, the most obviously went, went to France. Um, about 4,000 children uh, went on, on boats to Britain and other, others went to the Soviet Union um, and Mexico and Belgium. Um, yeah. There was no mass uh, intake of, of refugees uh, to Ireland. Um, but the Galisteggis, um, well, Margarita and the five children uh, boarded the, the steamship Havana, which had taken quite a lot of refugees out of Bilbao uh, at the time. Now, the Irish Times described what it uh, termed painful scenes at the Bilbao Port, where it said a loudspeaker called out the name of each child in torn, and a steady stream of parents crowded the riverside, taking their children by the hand, 
down the river to where the ships were waiting. Um, they finally sailed to uh, Bordeaux. Uh, they disembarked to Bordeaux, and along with other families and some Basque soldiers, they were accommodated in a convent. And as I said, uh, within weeks of that, uh, Belbel fell, and Eloise was forced uh, to leave Belbel. Um, so Belbel fell on the 18th of June. Um, he arrives, uh, meets up with the family, uh, but at that time there was no prospect of him getting any work uh, in France. Um, now we did have uh, business interests in Ireland through the Irish Iberian Trading Company. Um, so in September 1937, uh, the family sets out for Ireland and set up home in Gibstown House in the Mead Gaetot um, in, 19, in September 1937. Now that house was owned by Ambrose Martin. Uh, who we talked of earlier, uh, who was the man who, who delivered the, the talk in Bilbao about coming them off. And Ambrose Martin was the director of the Irish Iberian Trading Company. Now that company had originally been founded in 19... There's, there's an interesting story about this, but I won't go into great detail, but that company had been set up during the economic war uh, with Britain. Uh, Fianna Fáil came to power in 1932, and they had uh, adopted a policy of refusal to pay the land annuities. Um, so an economic war developed between Britain uh, and Britain put on huge tariffs on agricultural goods coming from Ireland. So the idea was to set up an alternative trading route. And that alternative trading route was the Irish Iberian Trading Company. And a company in Bilbao which is called Uskera, which is it's spelled EU, E-U-Z-K, which is the, the stem of Us, Us, Uska, Uskan, uh, and then Aaron, E-R-I-R for Ireland. So, so it was a, um, so they exported, um, or sorry, yeah, from that actually the, one of the, the figures who was involved in this establishment that was the Irish ambassador uh, to Spain, uh, Lee Paul McCurney, uh, who features in our story later. Um, so the, um, yeah, so it exported cattle, pork, potatoes, eggs, and other foodstuffs from Ireland uh, to the Bay and other ports in the south of Spain. And, Amongst its directors was a uh, temporary Fianna Fáil TD, Sean Hayes. Now, during a debate in Mensa House in 1937, uh, Fine TD and fascist supporter Paddy Belton denounced the company for trading with the Spanish Republic, accusing it of quote, feeding the red soldiers of the Antichrist in Spain and describing Ambrose Martin as one of the most pronounced and prominent communists in this country. Um, so, the Ganasegis arrive, um, they set up, sorry, that was just. Uh, photograph of some of the child refugees um, that were taken off at the port in, in, in Bilbao. Um, and this, the, the building in the centre there, uh, beside Hughes' pub, was, uh, that's in the markets in Dublin, uh, Smithfield, uh, people might be familiar with it, but that's where uh, the office of the Irish Trade Trading Company was based. Um, so that, that was its building there. So this is the family, um, I say there was three boys and two girls, uh, they set up home, it was quite a, quite a substantial piece of land that was there. Uh, Eloise had initially wanted to set up a bicycle making factory but uh, permission was refused by the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, so instead he worked the farm um, and later set up a sawmill. And now the children, uh, they attended uh, the local school in St. Dalton's. Um, they learned Irish, uh, participated in annual fishing it, where the girls Ninbe and our GNA won a number of prizes and the boys both played uh, or so the three boys uh, played uh, football. Now there's an interest in little aside. Um, um, yeah, so this is just a newspaper cutting um, from the Irish press uh, which um, kind of reports on, on uh, Argina winning, uh, she was five at the time winning a prize in the, uh, in the fish. Um, and just some, some details about uh, uh, the father. Um, there was, a, there was a, also a report in the Irish Independent at the time, similar report, except if you, if you note here, uh, the report said, this I discovered an Irish home from home in the, Gal in the Gaeta colony of a true Basque family. Um, now, the Irish Independent reported Argenia as being Spanish. So her father wrote a letter <coughs> to the Irish Independent and asked them to, uh, or to, to clarify that, that she wasn't in fact Spanish, that she was Basque. So the Irish Independent did 
uh, publish a clarification uh, which led to an angry exchange with the Spanish ambassador. Um, so uh, caused somewhat of a diplomatic incident. So the Irish Independent then had to clarify that we were asked to say that the statement published on the 5th of June, and they, they, they then mix up Arginia as a boy, Arginia as a girl, but anyway, um, that, Ar um, that Arginia is a Basque was published expressly at the request of the boy's father. That followed a major row with the, uh, the Spanish ambassador who was quite uh, put out by the fact that, um, uh, that the Irish Independent had clarified the fact that Arginia was, was Basque and not Spanish. Um, so anyway, uh, during the summer months, uh, the children kept out on the farm um, and travelled to Navan, which was about five miles from Gibstown, um, to deliver or sell uh, vegetables in the local shops. Um, now, it was on return from one of those, uh, you may not be able to see that very clearly, um, but it was on return from one of those trips um, that Ecare took a phone call. Uh, this was in July 1940. Um, and at the other end of the line was a friend of his father's from Bilbao uh, with the extraordinary news that he was part of a group of 11 Basques, uh, 10 men and one woman, who had just arrived on a lobster boat uh, in Cove Harbour in Cork following a late day voyage. Now, the, the immigration officer at Cove had given them unconditional permission to land. So this group, who were they? Well, they were all, well, many of them were friends of, of Elias. And some of them were quite prominent uh, Boston Nationalists, including the, the General Secretary of the Boston Nationalist Party. Um, they included a stockbroker, a doctor, three merchants, a topographer, an engineer, a pilot, sea captain, and a naval officer. There was one woman among the group, 26-year-old uh, Miran Arantea from Bilbao. Uh, Jose Camino, uh, he was the only one of the group who could actually speak English. And he was questioned by the guards uh, at Cove, and he informed them that they had originally fled Bilbao in 1937, uh, as many Basques had after the bombing of Guernica, and they sought refuge in uh, saint jean de Luz uh, in the French state. Um, and the Nazis invaded France in May 1940 and made a rapid uh, progress through, uh, through France, and were about to enter saint jean de Luz when this group of Basques felt it was no longer safe for them to be there. And they were quite, a lot of them were quite wealthy, so they had the resources and the finance to uh, hire a lobster boat. It cost them £700 at the time, which was quite a lot of money at the time. Um, and on the 25th of June, they left with a captain and five, uh, five crew. Um, their original plan was to travel to England. Uh, it's not really clear, but uh, I've always got to say he was a friend of theirs, but they, they decided to land in Ireland instead. Um, and. Um, Jose Camino uh, described in his uh, in a letter. Now, a lot of the information I got on this was was uh, accessed from the uh, the military intelligence files in Cabo Barracks. Um, so there was quite a lot of uh, um, detail on that because the military intelligence at that time G2 intercepted uh, mail. Um, so a lot of that was was available. So it was quite interesting. A lot of stuff that was there. Uh, but one of the letters that was intercepted was from Jose Camino. I'll just briefly quote it, but it, it just states here that um, owing to my pro basque sympathies and my anti-Nazi and anti-fascist campaigns, I, I am condemned in Spain for the most severe punishment. I escaped from Muscadi because I was certain of being shot if caught by the phalangists, and again I escaped from France in very exceptional and dangerous conditions when the Germans entered, entered saint jean de Luz, where I resided. Exhausted and without food, I reached the Irish coast after an eight day voyage. Um, the guard seized a lot of documents, they had a lot of documents, um, some of which were quite not historic, uh, particularly around the naval documents that they seized, which I wasn't able to get access to. Um, but anyway, they stayed for a couple of nights in uh, the Imperial Hotel of Cork, and then uh, they, there was taxis arranged for them uh, to travel to uh, Gibstown to live in the Gulf States. Um, now, news of their arrival caused a lot of consternation in the Spanish Embassy. Um, and the ambassador uh, who we met earlier, uh, Juan Garcia Ontiveros, uh, was, was uh, quite angry at the fact that this group of Basques had been given unconditional permission to, to land. Um, and he accused the group of uh, stealing a considerable quantity of gold that represented uh, Spanish public funds and of being fugitives from the police. 
Um, he demanded their extradition to Spain and also wanted the Irish government to supply him with the full names, nationality of, or, or nationality of origin and the place of birth of each of their parents. Um, now, the Irish government refused those and following inquiries established that there was no gold found in their possession. Um, now, while the government was prepared to offer the Basques political asylum, um, there was concern in the department and in uh, military intelligence um, about their presence in Ireland. Uh, the, obviously, it was during the war, they were concerned about um, what alignments uh, different groups might have. Um, and the Spanish were uh, causing a lot of uh, heat, if you like, in terms of what they, who they considered to be political en enemies of the Spanish government. Um, so, there was, I have to say, I mean, there was quite a benign attitude to the Basques. I mean, they would have had, and Alois Gavastegui in particular had a lot of contacts with the FFO. Um So, they got uh, quite a, a welcome, if you like, or certainly a positive reception, um, given his, given the contacts that he had. Um, I mean, he would have had contacts with a lot of Fianna Fáil TVs, the ambassador, um, the, the Irish ambassador to Spain, um, Leopold Kearney was a close friend of, of Ambrose Martin. Um, so they did have a lot of contacts, but there was a lot of concern amongst uh, military intelligence um, about their presence here. Um, and one of the, the issues that was raised um, was their political outlook. Um, now, they didn't really establish anything on Elias. Um, one of the things they did state was that he uh, had a lot of contacts within the Irish language community. Um, but uh, he was well established in those circles. Now, Elias is, is the uh, man to the right, or sorry, to the left. On the right there is uh, Donald Abukala, um, who was a 1916 veteran. He fought in the GPO. He's actually from Pilar, he's from uh, Manute. Um, and was a prominent Gaelic leaguer. Was, was uh, previously been a very close friend of Howard Pierce. And Pierce actually had taken a case. Um, he was prosecuted by the British government at the time for registering his business in Irish um, and for displaying uh, his cart. He had a shop in, in Manute and he displayed his cart in Irish and he was prosecuted for that. Now that was one of the only cases that Port Pierce took as a barrister. Now, he lost the case. Um, but so these were the kind of people that, that, that Alois had made uh, contacts with. Um, Donald Booker was a TD for, for Kildare as well. Um, and was later the last of my general uh, was what Fianna Fáil went to that. But anyway, um, that was uh, so he was quite a prominent figure. But Elias had built a huge library in Gibstown um, and mixed in all of these all of these uh, all of these circles. Um, so, um, well, in nineteen forty two, uh, the military intelligence said it kept the group under a lot of surveillance and intercepted all of their mail. Um, but by 1942 it concluded that the group had not concerned themselves with Irish political matters and while they were strongly hostile to Franco and the Flange, they were not red or communist, uh, quote, and were, not, were on good terms with various clergy. Which obviously was uh, an important consideration for military intelligence to look close to the clergy. But anyway, um, so um, at this stage then, with the arrival of 11 uh, Basques, uh, there was seven in the family. Uh, there was also the secretary of the Irish Marine Trading Company was living there. Uh, there was a housekeeper and there was two friends, uh, also friends of, of the boys, uh, staying there during the summer. So you had 22 people living uh, in Gibstown, um, which obviously put huge pressure on the family. Um, now, as I said earlier, the group did have, uh, they were, some of them were quite wealthy, and it was, it was reported that Jose Camino had something like £60,000 in a bank in London, um, but couldn't get access to it obviously because of the war. Um, so money was a problem, uh, food was a problem, um, uh, and there was a lot of disputes. I mean, given that, that amount of people living across borders, there was a lot of a lot of disputes. Now, E. Carroll um, reported or, or recalled uh, going hunting um, for uh, rabbits and pigeons at the time to, to feed the household. Um, now Elias did, there was a there was a Basque government delegation in London at the time, um, and Elias did write to them seeking assistance, um, but uh, none was forthcoming. Um, now by late 1940, um, a lot of the group, or 
had left uh, Gibbstown, um, or some of the group uh, moved to Dublin, and by the end of the following year, by the end of 1941, some of them had left Ireland altogether. Um, two went to fight with the Free French Forces against the Nazis, and another joined uh, the RAF. Um, and interestingly, one member of the group, group had applied to join the Irish Navy, uh, but was refused on the recommendation of military intelligence, who reported that, quote, apart from being an alien, uh, he's committed to one set of belligerents in the war and should not be employed in any position of trust. Um, those that remained in Ireland visited the Gallus Stadies quite regularly, I mean, they, uh, and the road of their kindness and hospitality uh, extended to them uh, by the family. Uh, and this is just a letter uh, that I came across in one of the files, quite a nice uh, piece from uh, Jose Camino, uh, and it, it's expressing thanks to the people of Ireland and to official organisations. I just read it, it's quite a nice piece. Um, uh, you may be able to see it there, but I wish to take this opportunity of again thanking you all for the attention we have received from all official organisations and from all others. <coughs> you may be assured that to this sincere recognition of services rendered is united the wish on our part to collaborate always in the interests of this country who have been so hospitable and attentive to the Basques. Believe me to, your, to be your sincerely Jose Camino. Um, so, but obviously the group felt that, that they had been given a, quite a warm welcome and, and had been treated very well. Um, but there was also, there were difficult times too, obviously. Um, both of Elias' parents died uh, within two years of each other. Uh, and Margarita was also taken quite seriously ill. Um, and a letter that was intercepted by military intelligence, Elias got a sticky wrote to his friend Ambrose Martin in April 1945. Quote, uh, my mother has died. Uh, Marguerite has been very bad in Navan Hospital. Uh, this spell of, ba of sad misfortunes darkens our lives. Um, and the Gallus Stegis, they stayed in Gibbstown until 1945, uh, when they moved to a small flat in Stevens Green. Um, now both the, the two girls, Arjuna and Nimbe, they attended Sinai College, and the boys, um, the three boys attended Blackrock College. Um, Lander, the middle brother, um, proved to be a talented rugby player and captain the Blackrock uh, Black School rugby team to victory in the Junior Schools Cup in 1945. And there's a nice photograph. This is from the Irish Independent in 1945, and obviously to the right there, that's uh, uh, Lander to the left and his mother Margarita uh, on the right. Um, so, you know, they, they were very involved in. in um, in their communities uh, and schools. Um, uh, Iker recalled, uh, he, he did play rugby, he wasn't as talented at rugby as, as Lander. Um, he enjoyed playing football and apparently uh, he had been offered a, a trial with the Bohemians Football Club in Dublin, uh, but he, uh, he turned that down um, and pursued other interests later. But anyway, we'll come to that. Um, all the family became our citizens. Uh, well, this, this is kind of... Oh, yeah, I'll come back to that one. Um, in the late 1940s, uh, 1949, and that's just a notification. I don't know why, I meant to check but at the time, but uh, it was one of those things I missed. But it names the mother, father, and the three boys. It doesn't mention the girls, but I'm not sure why. Um, but that was just a notification in, in the press of their application for uh, Irish citizenship. Um, so. Um, so they became Irish citizens. Um, later then, both uh, Lander and Iker uh, studied in UCD. Um, Lander studied architecture and Iker studied engineering. Um, and some years later, um, Lander designed or helped to design this uh, really amazing stat or mon monument um, in Elfin Roscommon uh, in the early 1960s. Um, with his friend uh, Jerry Trimble. Uh, he designed the base, um, but uh, that was a memorial that was erected in, in to IRA volunteers um, from the Roscommon area. Uh, it's quite an impressive, uh, quite an impressive monument uh, that Leather had uh, helped to design. Um, so that kind of, Iker, um, Iker didn't complete his studies. Um, he decided to return to the Basque Country in 1952. Um, now, by 1959 he was being pursued by Franco's police 
Um, it becomes the year actually that uh, EFA had been established, uh, the Arab Revolutionary Organization, uh, established in 1959. Um, mm -hmm. But he was being pursued and uh, quite relentlessly, so he went on the run again. So he ends up in exile this time back across the border into Saint Jean de Luz. Um, he was settled in Biarritz, which is quite close to the French Spanish border. Which brings us back to the start. So it was there that he became the subject of a deportation order in 1962. Uh, now, the background to that deportation order was that uh, it related to the, the Algerian War. Um, in 1961, the OAS, which is the secret army organization of, it was a Fari uh, French paramilitary organization that opposed uh, independence for Algeria. But, uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle had, had uh, granted. Um, now the OAS was established in, in, uh, in Franco Spain and they were located, or some of their occupants were located on the French Spanish border. Um, now they were lodging uh, component bomb attacks from the Nostri San Sebastian, uh, which is uh, right on the border, on, on the French border. Um, Large bomb and gun attacks in, in, from there in France. So uh, Charles de Gaulle had requested that Franco have these operatives removed from from that area, from from uh, San Sebastian. Now Franco agreed to that, um, but on the condition that de Gaulle would expel uh, 18 Basques who were operating on the other side of the border. So who were uh, launching attacks um, from Saint Jean de Luz and uh into uh, uh, San Sebastian, um, and that's where Eric Kerr became the subject of it. So he was, I suppose, part of a bit of the international intrigue, if you like. Um, but he was then expelled from Biarritz to the north of France um, for quite a few months, and then obviously the, the family had a lot of contacts in Ireland, um, and they contacted TDs here who raised um, Eric Kerr's case with the Taoiseach. Um, and there was strong representation made to the French Embassy and after a couple of months he was allowed to return um, to Biarritz. Um, so he settled there for, for quite a few years but um, all of the, with all the children growing up, um, Elias' father and Margarita, they, they returned to the Basque country in, uh, well, to the, onto the French side of the border and St. Jean de Luz. Uh, sadly, they never got to return to their home in Bilbao. Uh, Elias died in 1974. Um, Franco died in 75, um, the following year. So they never got to return as a couple. Um, but the Irish press published uh, quite a lengthy tribute to him at the time of his death. I concluded, I just quote this, uh, Elias was a man who enriched all who were fortunate to meet and know him. Uh, to his wife Margarita and his children goes the sympathy of the great host of his great host of Irish friends. Um, and Margarita died in 1988, um, and the sisters Zargina and Nimbe, they both married Irishmen. Um, and Nimbe is actually her, her husband only died this week, uh, Vincent O'Kelly. Um, they both married Irishmen and live. Uh, they had lived. Uh, uh, Nimbe had lived in, in the U.S., but she came back to Ireland last year. Uh, so they both now live in Ireland. Um, Iker's younger brother Lander, who, who designed that statue, he died in only in 2014. And uh, his youngest brother Unai, he was killed tragically in a car accident in the late 1980s. Which leaves us with Iker. So, um, where are we? Back to that. Um, so Iker married uh, Maita Sassiesta in the early 1950s, and they had three children. Usune, Laurie, and Aitor. Um, in 1977, which was two years after Franco died, they returned to Bilbao um, before settling in the coastal town of Algorta, which is quite near Bilbao. Um, he worked in the Bilbao shipyards and remained politically active throughout his life. Um, in later years, he wrote a political column for several Basque newspapers uh, and also directed two local choirs. Um, but the the struggle for Basque independence uh, remained constant, and like many Basque nationalist families, uh, the Galisteggis would again experience uh, the pain of imprisonment and exile. Now, Iker's, Iker and Whitey's daughter, 
uh, Sunay was imprisoned um, for political activity and two of his nieces and one of his nephews who were the children of Lander uh, are still in prison, they're serving quite lengthy prison sentences uh, and are dispersed several hundred kilometres from home um, which is, is, I mean this is one of the, it's a demonstration in, in Bilbao every year, in January every year calling for the return of, of Basque prisoners to the Basque country, there's a policy of dispersal of prisoners um, so they're sent to prisons in many cases in the, the southern tip of Spain which causes a lot of uh, grief for their families obviously in terms of visits and that. Um, so I uh, say so three of Lander's uh, children are still in prison. Um, in 2009 then, so Iker is 80 at this stage um, and he was hauled before the Spanish National Court on a charge of glorifying terrorism. Uh, he had been interviewed, it was part of a documentary that was made um, and during the course of the interview uh, he was, the interviewer asked him if uh, members of ETA uh, should ask for forgiveness. Um, now Iker was quite unrepentant, unrepentant and he responded, quote, uh, I do not have to apologise. Uh, the Basques have never been asked forgiveness for the 40 years of Franco's dictatorship in which thousands of people were killed and buried in ditches and mass graves. Um, now, he was brought before the courts and was given a sentence, uh, as I say, he was 80 years of age at this stage. He was sentenced to one year and three months imprisonment. Um, now, according to the courts of Spanish law, if, if a sentence is uh, of two years or less, you don't actually serve the time in prison. Um, but he was convicted of uh, what was termed glorifying terrorism for those, for those comments. Um, now, I did have the pleasure of meeting Nicker some years ago, um, in two, I think it was 2014. Um, I met him in his home in, in Algorta and did an interview with him, which is where some of the uh, material for this, for this uh, talk has come from. Um, now, he was very typically Basque, um, a great host full of energy um, and great storyteller, and had a kind of a, when he spoke in English, his accent was quite a bit of a Dublin accent. Um, uh, he did recount, I mean, a great love of chess, um, and this is a photograph of him from the Irish Press in 1943. Um, he won a, a school's uh, a chess championship. Uh, but he did recall that his love of chess, uh, he was in Black Rock College at the time, um, that the priests in Black Rock allowed boys who played chess to stay out for an hour later in the evening time, uh, which afforded him the opportunity. He was, he was uh, he had an interest in a young girl that, that uh, worked in the shop here, like, <laughs> so I gave him the opportunity to pursue that. But uh, he was he was a great, as I say, a great storyteller. Um, and he did recall his time in Ireland with great fondness, and it was obvious that he had a great affinity. He visited Ireland quite a lot uh, after he left, and all of his family did as well. Um, so they have a great affinity here. Now he did recall, and it was kind of, uh, it, was a, it was a piece I wasn't expecting during the interview, but. Um, and so basically he, he in, in the 1960s, as I said earlier, he had been uh, the subject of an expulsion order. Now obviously he had a lot of contacts in Ireland at that time. They had lived here for, for quite a number of years and had built up a lot of contacts. Um, in the, as I said earlier, in the late 1950s there was the establishment of a, an armed organisation called ETA. Um, now E. Kerr recalled in the early 1960s that he did return to Ireland. Uh, and he returned here with uh, two of his comrades uh, and they made contact with the IRA uh, and they spent six months here. Um, he rented a flat, uh, the, the three of them rented a flat uh, in Dublin and then they spent uh, some time in Cavan uh, training in the use of arms and explosives with the IRA. Uh, it's probably one of the first, I mean a lot of people put the relationship if you like between Basque nationalism and Irish republicanism um, a bit later, or, or maybe you know, in the, the kind of uh, late 60s, early 70s, or maybe even again a bit later. But the Galisteghi family, I suppose, were, were probably a key um, contact or a key link between uh, the Republican movement in Ireland and the Basque nationalist movement, um, given they had lived here from the mid 1930s. Um, so it was quite an extraordinary life. Um, I mean, he. he um, 
he remained unwavering in his in his uh, support uh, for Basel. Um, and while it was there, actually, it, I don't know if I, oh yeah. So this he presented me with it, which was quite a, an honour to receive. But it, it's a letter-bound uh, publication. Uh, it's quite a beautiful. It's all hand illustrated. I, I can pass it around. But uh, there's a quote from James Connolly in it. Um, but his father had produced this in 1932. Um, so it's, uh, I can pass it around. It's, it's just a bit careful with it. But, um, you don't have to flick through it. But so. Uh, so yeah, so that was kind of so. Sadly, Eker died only um, in February. Uh, he died peacefully. Aged, he was 91. Uh, he died in, in his home in Algorta. Um, I suppose, I mean, to, to kind of sum up his, uh, as you can see, it was a pretty full life. Uh, now, and I've kind of probably rushed through, but there was a lot to kind of get through. But I mean, he survived two dictatorships. Um, he was an active militant for many years. Uh, was on the run for for large parts of that time, and was exiled in, in several countries. And he had dedicated, I suppose, his entire life um, as an adult to the struggle for an independent Basque country and was surrounded by a lot of family and, and community. And I suppose in many ways, it's lives such as Icarus or Landers or Elias who maybe don't form, don't find their way into the history books, um, but who certainly, um, it's of such lives that, that uh, history is made. Um, Icarus, he survived by his wife, Maite, and the three children, his son, Laurie, and Aitor. Um, in Basque, we say Agor et a Bohore, which is goodbye and honor to Icarus. So that's, I'll finish it on that. Um, I don't know if I have any other. That's uh, Icarus in later years uh, in this, his hometown in Alberta with the uh, traditional Basque, uh, very good chapter. Um, but that was him, so that's me.